everybody, and welcome to the Learn It, Turn It, Burn It, Torque and Drag mini series, episode number four, brought to you today by DTIC, the guys over at DTICDrilling.com. Be sure to go over their website, give them a little, uh, you know, look, looky-loo, they got an amazing rotary steerable tool. Uh, go check them out. Huge, huge, huge thanks to them for being able to sponsor this and all the other sponsors throughout the series. Thank you guys so much for tuning in once again. Um, like I said, this is episode number four. So once we finish this, we have reached the halfway point of the Torque and Drag miniseries. If you've watched any of the previous episodes, let me know in the comment section now uh, which ones you've liked the most, which ones you've uh, learned something from. Um, so uh, obviously we've got today's, but let's give a quick little recap of what else we got coming up next. Next week is Neil Armstrong, uh, who's going to be going over applications. Neil's from Merlin. Uh, then we've got, uh, Mitch Abu Hassan, Hassan, I'm not sure exactly how to be able to pronounce his last name and I apologize, Mitch, uh, special operations, uh, is the week after that'll be February 14th. So on happy Valentine's day. Um, then we've got Debbie Subramanian. I hope I said that one right as well. Uh, we're doing real, our operations in real time, uh, torque and drag right uh that one's gonna be on february 21st and then finally instead of having seven episodes we're gonna have F eight episodes on february 28th welcoming back brandon foster from td unlimited to be able to, to kind of just wrap everything up and go over anything else that we might have missed so uh for everybody out there watching please let me know where you're watching from give us a quick little shout out here on the screen hopefully plenty of people that are tuning in uh that might be having a snow day let us know um all the comments and everything are starting to kind of roll in. So like I said, guys, let me know where you guys are watching from. Love to be able to give you guys a shout out here on the screen. Uh, Quarter available live. Join anytime. Oh, looks like we've got somebody already spamming the chat. Um, I'm not sure how to get rid of that. Doesn't show me. I can't. I can't on the other ones, but I can't on that one. Okay. Well, not putting that one up on the screen. Uh Mr. Randy saying back at it again. Eric, tuning in from sunny south of France. Uh, Mitch says, good morning. Thanks for being here, sir. Sorry for butchering your name just a second ago. Uh, we've got uh, links and user from Panama. I think this might have been the first time somebody's ever been watching this one or the Vidor Locks, this show from Panama. Uh, Houston is a regular. Calgary is a regular. Thanks for being here. Uh, we've got uh, somebody tuning in from North Dakota. John tuning in from Calgary. Donna tuning in from Houston. LinkedIn user from Iraq. All right, obviously holding down there in the Middle East in Dubai. Uh, Jason tuning in from Oklahoma. Cody tuning in from Oklahoma. Robert tuning in from Houston. Uh, Kritzinger tuning in from Houston. Adam from New Jersey. That might be a first as well. Uh, Calgary. New Jersey is not a typical place. Helmer tuning in from Lafayette, Louisiana. Brian Dugas from Louisiana. Um, Mr. Chima from Calgary. Calgary got a lot of people representing today. That's good. Uh, Reed tuning in from Midland. Dean from Katie. LinkedIn user from India. St. Paul, Virginia. That's a different one as well. Uh, Ian, uh, UG, I'm guessing maybe Uganda. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe correct me on that one. Um, uh, Felipe tuning in from Mexico. Thank you for being here, sir. George from Houston. Uh, Colleen from Jakarta. And David Jones tuning in from Colorado. Oh my gosh, these are coming in faster than I can hit them. So let's do this real quick. Too famous, too much temptation for somebody. Aberdeen, Scotland. Uh, Brad Watson from Houston, Newfoundland, Russia. Oh, wait, Argentina. Katie. Oh, you guys are going so fast. Again, Netherlands. Uh, Jonathan from Houston, Texas. Thanks for being LinkedIn user, Rockies. Mark Anderson, Conroe, Texas. Uh, Mason. Says hi everyone, and then Mark tuned in from Dubai, uh, and Alfredo tuned in from Houston, Texas. Thank you guys all so much for being here. We really do appreciate it. Do me a quick favor if you've learned anything throughout the series, if you learned anything from the Vitor Locksmith episodes, um, and you think you might learn something today, do me a favor and tag somebody in the comment section now. Um, if it's another drilling engineer, if it's a company man, if it's MWD directional driller, a bit hand, anybody on the drilling side, or anybody even downstream of that that might have, you know, might have some level of effect from, uh, you know, torque and drag. 
right? Um, just tag them in the comment section. Let them know about this amazing series to be able to get some education. Uh, just let everybody know uh, we've had numerous, numerous operators who are going to start putting this series into their educational portfolio, like some of their internal stuff. Um, so really, really appreciative of that. And if anybody else wants to be able to do the same, please reach out. Let me know. All right. Um, what else do we need to do here? Uh, let's reward our sponsors with a little bit of brand time. Tell them thank you, right? So, oh, I should say this. Uh, if you've missed any episodes, they're all on LinkedIn, um, as well as all of the presentations have been uploaded as well. I've did, I did one of the like, little newsletter things, right? So you can go and see those. Um, uh, and uh, if you want to make sure that you get the notifications, click follow and or click the notification icon to make sure that you know when we're actually going live so that that would be, you know, be like, oh, it's live. You get a little notification you can jump on there you go right um so need to say that uh what's next oh put in hashtag dtech right go ahead and do it do it now um and you will win yourself one of these big fancy drill bits so check this one out purple 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 gold let's get the there uh, you can kind of see maybe right inside of the sea if i can do it just right. No, nope. not coordinated with this mirror stuff good enough yet. There you go. Gibson reports win yourself a giant drill bit. This is a full eight and a half inch with real threads. Those are real threads. This will this will made up for the box end on a motor. Right? If you want to win yourself a drill bit, type in hashtag DTEC right now. Um, and and don't be greedy. Tell your friends about what we're doing. Oh, I totally forgot to change the background. There we go. Now we got the right background on there as well. All right. So uh, here's a quick little promo video from our friends over at DTEC. We're a small team, right? Um, so we're very reactive to customers. We try to be uh, very helpful, right? Um, not just to what is best for DTEC, but also what's best for the operation as a whole. We're unique in the fact that we can deal with directly with operators or just through the directional company, either way, which is the more traditional route. But either way, our goal is right to make sure that the well's delivered as fast and as accurately as possible. DTEC's excited to be a part of this a lot of different reasons. One is just the expertise that this Torque and Drag series is going to bring together. Everything from rig contractors to professors to you know different engineers. So uh, a wide wealth of experience that the industry can learn from, that DTEC can learn from. We're always very happy to learn and then also to share our knowledge. We don't see Torque and Drag ever going away as well as continue to get more complex, longer, while performance continues to be pushed. So it's something that you know we're always looking forward to learn and, and hear uh, new insights on, on those topics. All right. Well, guys, like I said, it's your chance to put in hashtag DTEC to get yourself one of these big 3D printed drill bits. These aren't the little ones. These are the big ones. Like, you can see. That's, that's as, as, yeah, big as my head, right? So, it'll take four days, four days to print on the 3D printer, right? Um, not to mention the the filament to make those not cheap, right? And all you have to do is just type in hashtag. You can't even buy these. I don't sell these. The only way to get yourself one of these is to either be in the office directly next to me. So Kay Jackson got one. Uh, or you have to watch this show and type in hashtag DTEC. I don't know. Oh, I did give one to a client. So there's that. So there's a couple of ways, but the main way to be able to get it is right here. Uh, all right, so let's do a quick little giveaway. Let's uh, add this to the stream. Let's say we've gotten 58 entries so far. Remember, that's just hash. Oh, that doesn't even show up, so it's pointless. Okay, white background, white lettering does not work. All right, let's see if we can make it break 60. I'll give it like another 10 seconds. We go 10, 9, 8, 7. one okay nobody else can type it in okay no worries all right so here we go let's hit the drawing yep 59 entries so let's see who the lucky winner is today and i appreciate all you guys watching as well as dtech appreciates it too number 60 came in there so george 
George, reach out to me on LinkedIn and or you can reach out to Tracy, who is my assistant, either one of us, and we will get you a drill bit sent your way. All right. For the whole reason that I, everybody is here, over 100 people watching in real time, let's get on with the show with Dr. Stefan Menon. Thank you, sir, for being here. Thank you, David. Thank you, David, for that invitation. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh. Well, I so I guess that you're going to be talking to us about torque and drag today, correct? Yeah, correct. And special, specifically on soft and stiff modeling, the difference between the two models. Quick question. How long have you been working in with, with torque and drag? How long has this been an issue in the industry? Maybe too long, right? So, no, I uh, started to work on that uh, almost 20 years ago uh in uh, france paris so i did uh, some research at paris school of mine starting with a bha and going up along the drill string look at torque and drag and buckling and fatigue and vibration so yeah and it's still there and people are still talking about uh, torque and drag models the soft the stiff the buckling the post buckling so yeah i will try to uh, explain a little bit the difference between all these models um and uh yeah well so thank you so much for being here i'll go ahead and bring your presentation up uh for everybody that is watching if you guys have any questions throughout the presentation if you can cite the um uh whatever the the powerpoint slide number is um uh, or just a little bit of context into your question don't make your question too long right Put as much as in there as you need, but try not to make it too long because we can't show the whole thing at, towards the end. But as soon as we get done, or, or as soon as uh, Stefan gets done with his presentation, then we'll come back and we'll answer ever all the Q and A uh, in order. Right. So uh, feel free to throw out your questions, and uh, we'll get started. So, Doctor, it's all you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, David, and uh, thank you, uh, Brendan Foster, for putting my name in that list on talk and drag. Uh, so I want to also uh, say hello to my colleagues in the US, uh, in France, India, Argentina, Colombia, and in the Middle East. Uh, say hello to them and thank you everyone for attending that uh, session. Uh, so yeah, let's get uh, started just uh, a little bit um, about my, uh, my career. So yeah, as I said, so I started uh, in France in uh, Paris School of Mine. Uh, doing some research. So my PhD was about the directional behavior of PDC bit. And then uh, joined uh, uh, Min, uh, Min Paritech as a researcher and doing some research uh, with uh, operator service company on BHA, talk and drag, buckling, uh, casing wear, fatigue, vibration. Uh, and then after I joined, I decided to quit the university and uh, join DrillScan uh, full time as uh, the general manager and recently uh hnp acquired drill scan so almost four years ago uh, so pretty happy to uh, be with hnp and now my role is a technical fellow at hnp uh, i'm part of a global research and innovation team grit and uh, today i'm in tulsa very cold today a little bit snowy uh, yeah, this is who I am. So yeah, let's get started. Uh, we have a, a lot to cover today. Uh, so this is the outline of uh, my presentation. So first, uh, a little bit of context. What problem do you want to solve? I will go back to the tortuosity and boreal oscillation dog legs uh, because it's key, in fact, uh, to differentiate soft versus stiff string model. I will talk about also our unique way uh, to reproduce actual tortuosity in torque and drag using a BHA model, which is unique, I think, in the industry. Uh, a little bit about uh, the drill string borehole uh, interaction, uh, you know, that contact point calculation. And then I will go to the soft uh, versus stiff string models. I will uh, show some examples about the difference. Uh, and then uh, go to the buckling uh, theory, the post buckling, our also new, uh, let's say, model, the buckling severity index, some case study, and also some uh, latest development about uh, 
how to improve uh, again and again, you know, the talk and drag uh, software because there are new technology in the industry, and it's very important to to uh, to account for uh, that in the in the talk and drag uh, model. So a little bit of context. So what problem do we want to solve? Uh, so this is a, a, a 3D view of uh, okay. There is an exaggeration about uh, the, the diameter <clears throat> of, of a tubular. But this is a typical situation in an unconventional wellbore, where you have uh, the vertical section, uh, you have a curve with a high dog leg, and you have now also a long lateral section. And the problem that we want to solve is uh, to, to, to determine the contact, all the contact, the loads, the forces, how that pipe, BHA, drill string, is in that very uh, tortuous wellbore. So you see some arrows with different colors uh, that represent the contact. So the contact can be very high uh, in presence of high dog leg. Uh, the color on the pipe uh, represents the bending stress. So you see some red color, which is bad, uh, high bending stress, meaning that there is a risk of uh, fatigue uh, for that. And, and you can see on the, on, the, on the lateral section that you have a kind of uh, snaking pipe. This is the buckling. Uh, the pipe takes uh, an helical shape, uh, higher contact forces, higher friction, so a risk of lockup. So we're, we're going to cover everything, uh, but you can see that that problem at the end of the day is very complex because the, the, the well path is 3D, there are some dog legs, uh, there are some different all sizes, the, the well bore is not smooth, uh, not the same size, so we need to try to model that the best way we can. So we're going to, to cover that uh, today. But let's go back to the tortuosity, uh, because um, when we put uh, a pipe or a drill string in a well bore, uh, the well path is tortuous, and that will determine uh, the contact point, where the contact are. Uh, it can be smooth, it can be localized. Uh, it's not easy, and the fact also that we we don't measure that very well or quite often, and we have always um, a limited knowledge of a trajectory, but we have to deal with it, right? We have to deal with the data that we have. So when we talk about the, the, the origin of micro dog legs, uh, so first, uh, it can be due to the directional system we use. Uh, so if you use a steerable mode motor, uh, you have a kind of uh, slide rotate pattern. So you see on that graph the inclination versus depth, and you see the green curve that create that slide rotate pattern. You slide, you rotate, you slide, you rotate, and you create some, some dog legs. So it's typical of a job of a steerable mud motor. But you can have also that tortuosity with the RSS, uh, whatever point the bit system, push the bit system. There is some kind of tortuosity. And, and you need to, to consider that in any talk and drag software to be sure that we have a realistic uh, computation. The, the origin of micro dog legs can be also the rock formation. Uh, when you cross some um, interbedded formation, uh, for example, on that slide, you see a, a transition from a soft rock to a hard rock. At the interface between the soft and the hard, you're going to create a local dog leg. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's small, but that local dog leg can then transfer in some borel oscillation. So you see on the on the right slide on the right side of a, of a slide. So you see some borel oscillation. So the origin of that at the beginning is a tiny dog leg, and depending on the BHA, the stabilizer going through that local dog leg, you can you can excite uh, that first dog leg and create a kind of borel oscillation. And again. Uh, our topic today is about talk and drag. So when you put a drill string or a pipe in that kind of uh, tortuosity, you will create some uh, localized contact forces, and you need to be able to 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 uh, to model that. So again, so an example of a job of a rotary steerable system along the lateral. So it's a shell play application. So you see the inclination uh, versus depth. Uh, in green, you have a standard survey. So remember, the spacing is about 90 feet or so. And in red, uh, this is the wireline data. So inclination measurement taken after. And you can see that the, 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 the curves are different, uh, meaning that, uh, yes, we have more dog legs than we think. 
And again, uh, when you put that restring in that, so for most talk and drag software, or most of the time, uh, we just take the actual survey, the standard survey. So we run the talk and drag cal calculation in the green curve, but we should run the calculation in the red curve. But uh, if you don't have a continuous inclination, or if you don't have a wireline data, you cannot do a good job. So the, the thing is, we have always a tendency when we consider the actual survey, we have a tendency to, to uh, tweak a little bit the friction factor uh, to, match, uh, to match the hook load data. Another example here, again, this is the steerable non-motor along the curve. So it's typical of a job done in, in the curve. Uh, so the sliding percentage, it depends on, on operators and the practice, but uh, typically, goes from 50% sliding to 80% sliding along the curve, but you have a tendency to create that slide uh, rotate pattern and create some kind of, uh, of tortuosity. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I did something <laughs> wrong. Just, uh, you closed out the- uh, Oh yeah. The, the, right the share, no worries. For everybody that's watching, if you're enjoying this so far, let us know. Um, and if you've got any questions or anything, let us know. Sorry, to let you know, yeah. Daryl, you might be watching a little bit delayed on the live stream, but we do appreciate the hashtag DTEC. Um, Daryl's like one of the few sales guys that comes and visits me. I appreciate him. All right, here, we'll get it back on there and we'll get you rolling yeah. again. Okay, sorry for that, guys. So yeah, I was um, uh, talking about the slide rotate pattern in along the curve uh, and yeah, here, so how do we account for that? So how do we uh, consider uh, the slide rotate pattern? How we, can we reproduce that with, in a talk and drag software? So the usual practice is to use uh, mathematical modeling. Uh, so we can use the sinusoidal or random tortuosity. So what we do, so we take a, a plan inclination and the plan azimuth, and we uh, apply a random variation around that plan value to try to mimic the, the actual tortuosity. So if you look at that plot on the bottom left, so you see the inclination, you see the depth. Uh, this in blue, this is the plan, so it's perfectly 90 degree inclination. And if you ap apply a sinusoidal um, um, variation, you will see that shape. Again, the idea of that, uh, Tortuosity is to try to have a more realistic well path and to be as close as possible to the, to the continuous inclination. Uh, the, 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 the difficulty we have uh, for that is what kind of variation, that, what kind of amplitude do you need to apply? What kind of period do you need to apply? And that, in fact, depends on the directional system. So you have seen before that if you use a rotary steerable system, a push, a point, if you use a steerable motor, depending on the bend angle, depending on the stabilizer placement, you will have a different kind of tortuosity because the tortuosity is coming from the BHA itself. So what we, what we have us is we have a unique way to represent, to reproduce the actual tortuosity uh, using a BHA model. So what do we do? So we put, so on the uh, top plot, uh, you see a BHA, uh, you see the bit, the stabilizer, the drill collar. And what we do, we do a, a deflection analysis and we propagate the borehole every foot or so to try to reproduce the actual well path. So. On the bottom, you see a, an animation, a video. So this is exactly what we do using the model. So we take, uh, of course, the BHA characteristic. Uh, we take the weight on bit. We take the tool face orientation. And we have all these input data that we process in the software. And we calculate the inclination and azimuth every foot or so. So at the end, what we are able to do is we are able to to reproduce uh, the, the well path. So before going to the result, let me talk about the BHA model uh, that uh, we have uh, developed over the last uh, 20 years now. So what we do in that BHA model? So <clears throat> what we do, we do a coupling between the rock, the bit, and the BHA. 
So for the rock, uh, we consider uh, the UCS of a, of a rock, and we consider the characteristic of a, of a bit. And once we have that, we are able uh, to calculate the deflection of a BHA. Uh, so you have an example on the bottom. So you see uh, some contact forces <coughs> at the stabilizer. You see some being stress. So the main goal of a BHA model is to do some BHA design to be sure that you have a right BHA in the right application. And then after is to do some kind of optimization. So you want to first be able to build, to turn, and you want also to minimize the deflection or the bending uh, because you want to, to, to have a, a very smooth uh, wellbore. So this is what we do for BHA model. Uh, again, to design a BHA and to do some BHA optimization. But what we can do as well, you will see that later, is to reproduce the actual tortuosity using that BHA model. So uh, the BHA model, so we take into account the drill bit characteristic. So we calculate what we call the steerability, which corresponds to the side cutting ability of a bit. So depending on, on the gauge length, mainly. Uh, we calculate the working tendency. Uh, which has an influence on the turn rate of a system. And then after, we consider the rock formation effect. So it is the hardness of a rock, the UCS, the unconfined compressive strength, uh, and also uh, some potential anisotropy. Uh, typically, we can consider the deep angle of a, of a wellbore or some potential uh, interbedded formation. Again, we want to see all effect of a rock on the directional tendency of a BHA. And of course, the directional system, again, it can be a RSS, it can be a conventional rotary BHA, a steerable motor, and uh, potentially with or without any uh, rimmer on it. So once we have that, uh, so for the BHA model, uh, so the bit has an effect, uh, the bit design is also key, and especially uh, the gauge length of that bit. Uh, the typical gauge length is uh, from two inches to four, six inches. Now you have some taper gauge design, so a little bit on the gauge. So you need to account for all these uh, characteristics uh, to be sure to calculate what we call the bit stability, which has a strong effect on the bit rate and uh, ton, uh, bit rate of um, of a, of a system. The work angle, so the work angle, what is the work angle? So when uh, a system apply a side force, so let's say that the BHA is applying that force that you see on the screen, FL, in a given direction, the bit is going to move to the left or to the right of that side force. It's not exactly the same direction. This is what we call the bit work angle. And that will have an effect on the turn rate of a system. So in taking into account all these effects, we are able to predict correctly the bill rate and turn rate of the system. Uh, again, uh, to summarize, a uh, high steerable bit means that we have a high side cutting ability of a bit. And typically, the bit sterility number for most PDC bits is between uh, 5 and, and 40%. Uh, what is the effect of that? gauge length, so you see on the left, uh, you see some bits with a uh, one inch, two inches, four inches gauge pad. Uh, the effect is that if you uh, increase the gauge length of that bit, you're going to reduce the side cutting ability of a bit, meaning that you're going, generally speaking, uh, decrease the bit stability and also the build rate of a system. But again, it depends on the system, uh, the point of bit system, push a bit system, they don't work the same way. Uh, and we need to, to capture all these, uh, these effects. Uh, the rock hardness, uh, the same, uh, the BHA model enables to uh, consider uh, the rock hardness. Uh, so on that graph, you see uh, the bit sterility versus uh, the UCS, the hardness of a rock. So the same bit and the same BHA in a different rock will give you a different build rate. So uh, generally speaking, uh, the, higher, uh, the, uh, um, the higher the hardness of a rock, the, the less build rate you will get. But again, it's just an example, it's just to highlight the fact that all these parameters, the bit characteristic, the hardness of the formation, the BHA system are key 
to be able to predict correctly uh, the bill rate of a system and as a consequence to predict uh, the, the tortuosity of a, of a system. So let's go back to what I wanted to show you. Again, I wanted to, to give you the, the fundamentals of a BHA model, but this is what we do. So again, we go back to the topic talk and drag and what we want to achieve. Again, the talk and drag, uh, an input of a talk and drag is the trajectory and the trajectory is key to be able to have a good uh, talk and drag result. So what we want to achieve is to be able to reproduce uh, the well path. So that is an example of result that we can achieve. Uh, so what we see, we see uh, uh, the inclination along the curve as a function of uh, um, depth. In uh, yellow, you see all these rectangles. They represent the standard survey, so typ typical spacing of 100 foot. In green, you see the continuous inclination. So that case, uh, we had the MWD with continuous uh, inclination measurement. And in red, this is what we are able to reproduce using a BHA model. So meaning that, yes, with a BHA model, without any continuous inclination, we can reproduce, we can have a good idea of the tortuosity we'll have on, on that well path. And that, again, will be key for us because we'll put the drill string in that tortuous well path and have a more realistic uh, torque and drag loads. An example here, so a zoom, what is happening there? So again, inclination versus depth. Uh, so it's ex exactly the same graph as before, but just a zoom on the slide and rotate pattern. So you see that when we slide here, we have a strong uh, build rate. Uh, up to 16 degrees per hundred feet. And when we stop the sliding, we go back to rotation, we have even a drop. So a drop of one degree per hundred feet. So this is the slide rotate pattern. And you can see that we can have a good representation of uh, the tortuosity in that well path. So this is what we do uh, in our engineering team. Each time we have to run the torque and drag, we go back to the tortuosity evaluation to the BHA to be sure that we have a correct well path, a correct well bore uh, before running any uh, trajectory. And you will see later on that as that has a huge effect on the on the buckling as well. So now the question is uh, what is the pipe deflection in a in a tortuous well bore? Uh, so again the tortuosity can be very different. Uh, the pipe can also be a casing string, can be a small drill pipe, uh, can be a BHA. So the question is, we need to calculate that uh, deflection inside that tortuous wheel bore. So now the pipe deflection in a tortuous wheel bore, the, the answer is, yeah, it's a question of mass, of course, of a pipe. It's a question of stiffness, uh, clearance as well. Uh, tortuosity, we have seen that. And also models. And this is where we are going to start to see uh, the difference between the soft and the stiff, because depending on the model, you, you, you don't have the same, the same answer. So typical talk and drag. So I know that uh, many of you have already uh, seen that in the previous uh, uh, series, uh, but let's go back to this uh, model a little bit uh, to refresh. Uh, so we have these soft string models. Uh, basically, we have some stiff string models with or without contact algorithm, and we'll explain why. And we have a stick string model with contact algorithm plus some post buckling capabilities. So the soft, um, yeah, uh, um, model first by Joan Sick and uh, his colleagues in '83, so a long time ago. Uh, so we have no stiffness, so it's, it's soft, uh, and the drill string acts as a cable, uh, so no uh, stiffness at all. And they assume in that kind of model that we have a continuous contact, uh, generally on the low side of a borehole. These models were 2D at the beginning and then 3D. It's very fast, uh, very simple. You can even build yours in an Excel spreadsheet. Now we go to the stiff string. So yeah, the main difference is that we take into account the stiffness of a pipe. Uh, some model, they continue to assume the contact uh, on the trajectory depending on the, 
curvature the inclination, so they do not calculate the contact. Uh, so it can be fast. And some others, they not only take into account uh, the stiffness, but there is no assumption about the contact. So the contact is calculated. It's unknown. And this is, uh, this is the most complex task of any uh, torque and drag calculation is that contact algorithm. And generally, a finite element uh, analysis is used uh, to solve that. So what we have developed um, at, uh, at Drillscan and HNP, so we started to work on that uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, we did some research at uh, Paris School of Mine. So we use the theory of linear elasticity. We don't use FEA, uh, meaning that the competition time is reduced. So we have, let's say, overcome let's say the limitation of FEA with regards to competition time, but we have exactly the same result. So we did some, uh, some comparison um, and we can have uh, for that a detailed description of a drill string, any string, casing, tubing, drill by BHA stabilizer can be modeled accurately. So there is almost no limitation on the meshing of a system. Uh, we can also even uh, handle uh, over materials. So at the time we, we did some study on aluminum drill pipes, so we, we could uh, take into account the fact that the, the density uh, of a material is less. Uh, we have that 3D trajectory reconstruction, so I discussed about that, uh, to be able to have a good uh, shape of a wellbore with a tortuosity using the BHA model. Uh, and the contact point calculation is the most complex, and I can tell you that uh, before having a robust and stable version of that algorithm, it was uh, uh, some years of research to do that. Uh, yeah, the fluid effects. So I will not talk about that today, but there is still that controversy, uh, pressure area versus Archimedes. Uh, I have just one slide at, at the end, so because we were going to publish something at the next uh, uh, drilling conference in Stavanger, and I think we have found some interesting uh, findings. Uh, competition time now is not a concern anymore. Yes, 20 years ago, I have to be honest, it was uh, maybe uh, too long, uh, but now with uh, multi-thread technology, uh, with uh, the REST API, the cloud, uh, yeah, competition time is not a concern anymore, it's, uh, it's fast. So for the contact, uh, so yeah, uh, you see a schematic of a pipe rolling uh, on the low side of a wheel bore. So there, there, there are two things. So first you need to calculate the position of that con contact. Uh, and also you need uh, through the friction coefficient because you will have a rotation of the pipe, you have a normal force and the pipe has a tendency to roll on the, on the wheel bore. And that is considered in the in, in the calculation. So, on the, on the right side, uh, again, uh, even though the gravity, of course, is uh, downward, uh, the contact is not always on the low side of a borehole. It can be on the high side, left or right. It depends, of course, on the tortuosity and also the tension on it. And we we calculate that. So now uh, the thing is, at the end of the day, uh, the pipe curvature is uh, sometimes very different than the borehole curvature. This is an exaggeration of, of that effect. But again, uh, it depends on the compression, if you have some buckling. Uh, also, the clearance, uh, of course, is key if, if, if you have some space for the pipe to deflect in the wellbore. Um, and also, of course, the tortuosity. So, when do we have a situation where the soft string is exactly the same as the stiff string? The situation is happening only if only you take uh, in, into effect uh, the, the plan wellbore, so a perfectly smooth wellbore. So, typically, you plan um, a shell play. Uh, well, so you have a perfect curve at, let's say, 8 degrees per 100 feet. And then after, you have a perfectly 90 degree inclination. Uh, so this is exactly on that screen, uh, the result uh, given by the stiff string model 
So you see that you have a smooth distribution of contact along the curve, and you have also a perfect distribution of contact along the lateral. So that soft string and stay string will give you exactly the same result because the solution is the pipe will stay on the low side of the wet bore, no tortuosity, the, cl the clearance is acceptable. Uh, but now, if you start to have some uh, tortuosity, and this is my next slide, you can see that, yeah, the difference is there. Yes, because the pipe has some space to deflect, uh, depending on the tortuosity you have. Uh, so you see that on that graph that the contact at, are not always on the low side of the wheel bore. You have some different colors, meaning that there are some localized bending stress and also along the, the lateral section. Yes, most of the time, of course, because of gravity, the contact is uh, about on the on the low side, but not uh, not all the time. And again, it will depend also on the compression uh, and the buckling, and and we'll see that later. So, uh, in presence of tortuosity. Uh, the stiff string model will give you a much more realistic estimation of friction and loads along the dress string. Um, my recommendation, uh, I know that uh, now we use some um, continuous survey or high density survey. My recommendation, if you have that, is to not use soft string because the soft string will have a tendency to overestimate the friction because again, the soft string is, uh, is similar to a cable uh, remaining on the low side of a wheel bore. So there is a tendency to overestimate the friction. And also uh, you have to know that most talk and drag software, they will give you result contact or friction every 100 foot or so. They don't give you loads on a shorter scale and because they use the standard survey. And if you go back to the equations of a soft string, uh, so on the top uh, you have a soft string equation with a, with a F, which is the tension, the linear weight, the inclination, the friction, all of that. But the most important thing is that DS which is the survey spacing. So for most stock and drag software, the spacing is about 100 foot. It works fine, uh, but if you start to give to that soft string some spacing about one or two foot, what the software will do is just uh, creates that, uh, that shape. And because you, you, you're going to create some localized friction, some uh, contact on the low side, so there is always a tendency to overestimate the friction. On the contrary, the stiff string will give you a more realistic well path. So you see the same simulation or the same example uh, going from the left, the soft, uh, to the right, the buckling, stiff string with buckling. Again, the soft has a tendency on, for the pipe to be on the low side, uh, so no stiffness. Uh, you have a smooth distribution of all the contacts. Uh, and kind of no radial clearance. You can run that soft string model on the left to a six, six inch ball, 12 and a quarter, 26 inch all, you will have the same result. So the stay string, you will have a contact calculation. So it depends on the clearance, uh, the stiffness. And now if you put some compression in it, and this is the, the, the example on the right, uh, you will see that you have some over, uh, some higher contact forces because this is the what we call the post buckling uh, calculation and we'll have a I have a few slides on it because this is key uh, to have a post buckling determination because we all drill these wells unconventional wells in exceeding a little bit the buckling but in in a safe way so again uh, soft versus stiff um, uh, of course, there are some differences in terms of uh, science, uh, not the same equations, uh, but in doing uh, many studies, case studies, uh, we have seen that the soft string does not predict buckling uh, onset in tortuous wellbore. It works in perfectly uh, wellbore, 90 degree perfect inclination well, but as soon as you have some tortuous wellbore, 
um, it failed to predict correctly the buckling. You have also uh, some underestimation of, of torque uh, sometimes. Uh, again, it's, uh, you know, generally speaking, it depends on the situation. Uh, the contact force also, we have seen that. Uh, they do not estimate properly the contact force on the drill string. And maybe most importantly, a soft string cannot monitor the drill string mechanical integrity because you do not calculate the bending stress, the fan mise stress, so you cannot look at that uh, mechanical integrity of a, of a drill string. So again, uh, just some example, uh, just to highlight the potential difference using soft and stiff. Uh, so this is the typical hook load at surface uh, versus depth for a deviated well. Uh, so for, for the tension, if you pull out your string and you uh, so the string is all in tension from the bit uh, to, a, to, a, to a surface. Uh, the soft and the stiff, the difference can be limited. Uh, most of the time, it's maybe 5%, 10% difference. But now if you run in all that string in a deviated wellbore, you will have some friction. And if you have some friction and tortuosity, uh, the stiff string will do a better job at predicting the hook load at your face. And on, on that example, the consequence uh, can, be, can be important because on that example, you, you might think that you can run uh, that string up to, let's say, 6,000 meters using the soft. But uh, if you use the same model, you can see that the stiff string predicts that you will have a lockup, so the hook load is close to the block weight at around 5,000 uh, meters. So um, again, it's coming also for the, from the post-buckling calculation. Other example of uh, torque while drilling. So what you see, you see the torque along the string uh, from the surface here to the, to, to the bit. So you start from the torque on bit here and you, you go along the, 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 the string and uh, up to the surface. You can see that with a stiff string, uh, you can predict a higher torque than the soft string and in some situation exceeding uh, the makeup torque of a connection. Another example in terms of um, uh, side forces, again, uh, we take the same simulation, uh, we just process that in two engines, the soft and the stiff. Uh, here in that situation, uh, there are some differences up to 50% in terms of contact forces. For that case, it's come from the uh, post-buckling calculation. Uh, so we consider the additional contact force in our stiff string engine due to buckling, and that um, is not well done by soft string models. I know that there are some equations just to mimic or to try to reproduce that, but they fail most of the time. Um, the situation where we have, uh, so we run a casing string or a drill string in the well bore, so we don't have any rotation. So again, it's a deviated well. This is the hook load at your face. Uh, um, yeah, hook load at your face here, the tension along the string. So typically, uh, when you run a string in a deviated well bore, you will start to have some compression. So you see that the, the compression stop here. And what we do generally is we compare that compression to the helical buckling load, and we can have uh, some differences up to 20% between the, the two models. To me, the most important thing for all what we do is to be sure that we avoid the failure along the BHA and the drill string. And that uh, is done uh, with a stiff string engine, of course, because you need to be able to calculate the bending stress and the fan mise stress. Uh, and we do that all the time in torque and drag calculation. So I know that torque and drag calculation, for some, it's just the torque and hook load at surface. But what we can do more is to be sure that you have some safe loads downhole at the BHA and the drill pipe, and we monitor that carefully uh, to avoid uh, to avoid some uh, costly uh, failure. Here, another example, uh, very helpful. So what we have, we have um, 
on the right side you see the inclination so it's uh, it's a curve uh, the curve with a slide rotate pattern and in that DHA, so the bit is here the bend is there with a mud motor uh, there were some uh, sensors in the MWD to uh, measure the bending moment, so the bending stress. Uh, and you see on that graph bending stress versus depth. So look at the kind of bending stress that we put on that MWD up to 30 KSI, which is uh, far above the fatigue limit. And you can see that, of course, uh, you cannot do that with a soft string. You need to have a stiff string. And in red, you have a measurement. In blue, you have a, the model. So you, you can see that we can have a pretty good idea of the bending stress in the tubular in that uh, curve um, of that uh, application. Again, I'm just telling you uh, the, the advantages of using a, a stiff string. And here, it's a good example because we can track uh, the fatigue of the MWD or uh, along the mud motor as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you as well is, uh, so here I'm going to show you some example of uh, only the stiff string model. But again, our recommendation is to try to get a good knowledge of a trajectory. Here, this is a situation. So we run in the hole a casing string uh, at TD, uh, five and a half inch casing string. Uh, and we do have two trajectories, one standard surveys in red, and the other one is the continuous survey. So look at the difference in terms of hook load at your face. It's about 40 kilopound difference if we use a continuous survey or high density survey or uh, a reproduction of the trajectory. So this is key for all what we do. Otherwise, you will have a bad estimation of the hook load. And again, the tortuosity is quite different from well to well. So our recommendation is to try to reproduce uh, the surveys all the time. Uh, it's not very long, it's fast process to have a better knowledge of the uh, torque and drag loads. Here is the same. Uh, so uh, we drill at TD uh, in an unconventional well bore. Uh, we have in red uh, the standard survey. Uh, in blue, the continuous survey. So you see a difference in just having two different trajectories of 2,000 uh, foot pound uh, in that example. So again, uh, if you uh, reach the limit of a top drive or if you reach the limit of, of a makeup torque, uh, you can have some bad surprise. So try to have all the good data at the beginning of any torque and drag uh, modeling. So let's talk now about buckling. Uh, you have probably seen these slides before, uh, but basically two types of uh, buckling. So what I call the conventional critical buckling loads. So you have on the left, the sinusoidal buckling, and on the right, the helical buckling. Uh, for the sinusoidal buckling, I think the industry is okay for that equation. Uh, but if you look at the right side on the helical buckling, uh, you see many equations depending on offers. And that lambda coefficient goes from 283 to 565. So who is right, who is wrong? Uh, so I think I'm going to try to answer to that question in the next slides. Um, here, how do we use? these equations. So typically, we run our talk and drag model, uh, especially when we run a casing string or drill string without rotation in a deviated well bore, because you will have some compression. And you want to compare that compression to the helical buckling load. And here, it's fine. You don't exceed the buckling load, so you are good to go. But this is how we use uh, these uh, buckling ferries. Uh, in the industry uh, today. So now the big question, uh, so these equations that you have seen before, they have been developed for these ideal well bore, ideal slant curve vertical, uh, because math simple, and we can find an analytical solution for that problem. But if we want to apply 
this equation to a actual well bore with some tortuosity, you will see that the rotation, the friction, and the dogleg, they have a great effect. So the question, can we apply these simple theories to actual well bore condition? Yeah, let me try to answer that. So in the next slide, uh, you will see some research uh, we have done at uh, Paris School of Mine a long time ago now. Uh, and you will see the, the effect of rotation. Uh, we will see the effect of dog leg. And we have validated that in the lab. Uh, so we had a small scale facility. Uh, we even rotated that pipe in the lab. And we are going to take the example of uh, horizontal well bore. We are going to have a situation where the well is straight, so a perf perfectly 90 degree inclination. And we're going to put some tortuosity in that well bore just to see the effect of that tortuosity on these buckling loads. That animation is just to show you, so the pipe is on the 90 degree inclination well bore. Uh, it's rotating, so you see that uh, drill bit on the top means that it's a simulation with rotation. And we want to vary the friction coefficient. So you see that when the friction is zero, zero, the pipe is exactly on the low side of the well bore. But as soon as you increase that friction coefficient, the pipe has a tendency to roll on the well bore. And that effect is key for buckling. In fact, uh, it facilitates the onset of buckling in case of, uh, of compression. So now if we put some, some compression on that pipe, so again, you see that the, the, bit, the bit that rotates, so it's a simulation without rotation. We put some compression about 20 kilopound, and you see that that pipe takes a sinusoidal shape. So yes, this is the sinusoidal buckling, the perfectly sinusoidal buckling in a perfectly well bore. And you see uh, some contact, so not only on the tool joint here, but also uh, on the body of a pipe because you have some deflection. And uh, yeah, that, that kind of buckling is not uh, dangerous at all because the, the additional uh, contact is limited and, and the bending stress is, is, is okay. Now, if we take exactly the same simulation, but what uh, we did here is we added a, do a local dog leg here just to see the effect. So we apply we apply the, the, the same compression. Uh, so everything is the same, uh, except that uh, dog leg here. So a dog leg of four degrees per hundred feet. Uh, and you can see that you have a different uh, picture here. So you start, you have still some kind of sinusoidal buckling uh, on, on the right side, uh, but you see that the pipe in the dog leg, in fact, the pipe, takes the shape of a dog leg. So there is that constraint, that dog leg, which is a constraint. And the, the pipe is not sinusoidal. It's not helical. It's a, it's a kind of what I call a, a dog leg buckling because the pipe has to follow the dog legs. So that can be done only with a numerical model. And of course, this equation, they, they, cannot, uh, they cannot model that uh, properly. Now let's go uh, further. Let's uh, increase the compression to 40 kilopound. So it's a simulation with rotation. Uh, and so it's a perfectly 90 degree inclination. And you see that we have a perfect helical buckling uh, that some equation can reproduce because there is no uh, dog leg. And, and uh, yeah, they're, they're okay with that uh, situation. So these equations are correct only if the well bore is uh, perfectly uh, straight with no dog leg at all. Now we do the same. We, uh, yeah, I don't have any, oh, yeah, animation here. Yeah, sorry, go back here. Yeah, so if we do the same here, yeah, let me run that, yeah. So we have uh, the same shape as before. We increase the compression to 40 kilopound. Uh, so you see that you don't have that perfect helical buckling there. But again, the pipe is constrained by the dog leg shape. So the dog leg, the shape of a dog leg has a strong influence on the buckling. Uh, and especially if you have a, a low clearance, because if you don't have any clearance between the pipe and the borehole, the pipe has no space 
to be deflected and has to follow that, uh, that dog leg. So we also validated that in the, in the well bore. So you see uh, on the right, so on the left, you see the simulation. And on the right, you see uh, the video of a pipe in a helical buckling shape. So what we have here is a, a rolling motion of a pipe inside the well bore. And this is, uh, this is helical buckling. So again, it was uh, the validation done uh, at uh, Paris School of Mine a few years ago now. So this is the buckling the facility, the small scale buckling facility where we verified uh, that uh, ferry. Uh, so we had uh, the possibility, so it's a 15 meter long uh, drill string with a one centimeter diameter uh, pipe and we could uh, vary uh, the dog leg. We could also uh, apply a rotation. And of course we were able to measure everything uh, from the top load to the bottom load, and also measure the, the shape taken by, by the pipe. The most surprising result we, we, we had is that kind of result. So let me explain that graph. So you see on that axis the top load, so we apply a load there, and the bottom load is there. So if you apply a given load there, and if there is no friction, you should receive exactly the same load here on that, on that end. If you do not have the same load, it means that you have friction, you have buckling. But on that example, in case of rotation, so you have to imagine that we rotated that pipe. We applied a, a load of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 to make the pipe buckle uh, voluntarily. And what, what we observe is that in case of rotation, you still have a good load transfer, meaning that if you apply a load here, you get exactly the same load there because of the rotation. The rotation helps uh, get the load transferred to the bottom, even though you exceed the helical buckling load. So it, it was a, it was a, a good finding. The, the downside of that is that you're going to generate some high torque on this pipe. Uh, so this is exactly the same uh, uh, test, but here we are looking at the torque. So you see that at the beginning, so here this is the compression. So we start from zero, no compression, uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. So you see that at the beginning of the test, uh, the torque is limited, but as soon as you start to exceed the helical buckling limit, you start to generate some high torque. But probably uh, in uh, our uh, wells drill today, again, uh, these laterals are very long. We exceed a little bit uh, these uh, buckling loads. And what we wanted to do is to verify that we can exceed uh, safely uh, this load. So, yeah, another example for the effect of the rotation. So this is uh, um, um, the, the pipe. So of course, there is an exaggeration of a scale here. The diameter has been increased relative to the length. Uh, so what we want to see here is that the rotation has a strong effect. So if you look at the uh, red um, curve of the blue one, so the red is a case where the compression is 1,000, but we do not rotate the pipe. And in blue, you have exactly the same compression, but we rotate the pipe. So you see that the rotation has a strong influence on the shape taken by the pipe. Again, same compression, but in one case, we do not rotate, and in the other case, we rotate. So you can see that you have a different picture. So this is captured by the model uh, now for for that torque and drag. Um, the lab is good, uh, the lab is good. Uh, the next step for validation is the field. Uh, so uh, we work with, uh, yeah, Statoil at uh, that time, Equinor now. Uh, they had a full scale buckling <coughs> uh, facility. Uh, so in fact, they have a cased all uh, trajectory. So a cased all trajectory is good because in that case, 
you know exactly uh, the whole size uh, of your of your whale ball and also they had some uh, very good measurement of the trajectory so what they did uh, so they put a drill string in that cased all trajectory and they put some strong weight on it on that string uh, up to 70 kilopond and they had some sensor along the string uh, to uh, see the weight on the transfer. And also what they did, once the pipe was buckled, uh, they run a gyroscope inside the pipe to measure the deflection of that uh, pipe following the bucking. So we got all these, these data. So it was the perfect uh, validation case for us. And, and this is what we, we had. So this is just an example. Um, if you want to read more, uh, we have a, a few paper on it. So what you see here, you see the azimuth of, in fact, of a pipe, because you have a snaking motion, meaning that the azimuth is going to change. So you have the azimuth versus uh, the depth. And in red, you have a gyroscope measurement. And in grid, you have a new buckling model. So you can see that we are pretty good at predicting the shape taken by the drill pipe, meaning that this is what I call the post buckling capability, meaning that we are able to determine the shape of the pipe after the buckling has occurred. And that is key if you want to see, okay, I can exceed the buckling, uh, but I, want, I don't want to exceed a given stress on it. So if we are, if we are looking at the existing buckling theories, uh, a summary, uh, if you look at the uh, left column, so what I call the perfect wellbore geometry, meaning that you have a perfect vertical, perfect curve, perfect 90 degree, these equations are correct. Uh, but uh, if you start to have some rotation effect, uh, some uh, tapered drill string with two joints, there, there is no uh, literature equation. There is no simple equation to, to describe that. So you have to go with a numerical model to capture the tortuosity effect, friction, rotation. Uh, otherwise, you will have uh, only a, a rough estimation of the, of the buckling along the well bore. So when after that research, what we have seen, and also the fact that we can drill this long lateral section the unconventional way, uh, we came up with a new idea of uh, about the buckling severity. Uh, so we wanted to better quantify the buckling severity index because again we exceed buckling loads when we drill these wells uh, now. So what we have derived is what we call a buckling severity index. So it's based on torque and drag calculation. Uh, so of course, you need to have a stiff string model for that because it accounts for the bending stress on the pipe, the contact force, and the von Mises stress. So in that case, depending on the risk, one, two, three, four, we are able to better predict the occurrence of lockup or the occurrence of failure, depending on the buckling severity index. And basically, we are much more interested in the bending stress along the pipe rather than the shape taken by the pipe. The shape taken by the pipe, we don't care at the end if the bending stress is OK. So, But if the bending stress is high, meaning that uh, you will have some fatigue, uh, there is a risk of high contact forces and a risk of, of failure. So how do we apply that? Uh, so this is a, a typical example of uh, unconventional well. So you have two calculations. So it's a drill string. Uh, we run uh, that drill string in the well bore. So we see here the evolution of tension along the drill string when we slide. So of course, when we slide, uh, yeah, we have no rotation at surface. We start with a given weight on bit. And of course, you have some friction and an increased compression along the string. And what we do generally, again, is we compare that compression to the uh, conventional buckling load. So here, what we have on top of that is that scale, that buckling severity index. So it's a, it's a risk from one to four. 
And you see here some orange and red color, meaning that yes, here the buckling severity index is high, meaning that there is a, a risk of lockup uh, or failure. If you look now at the rotary part, which is interesting because for most cases, uh, so you see that if you look at the conventional one, so there is a, just a risk of exceeding uh, the load there, but our uh, model, our buckling severity index is high here along the curve because the bending stress is high. The dog leg along the curve can reach, we have seen that, 15 degree per 100 feet, meaning that you have to uh, deflect that pipe in that strong dog leg, meaning that the bending stress is going to be high. So here you can see, uh, so yeah, we see the side forces on the right side here in gray. So the side forces are okay there, but you see that all these strong side forces along the curve generating that high uh, buckling severity index. So this is how we use that in uh, talk and drag. We look at the severity and what we recommend is not to exceed the severity three, uh, the high, and we want to stay in the yellow zone uh, with a medium risk. Otherwise, there is a risk of lockup or failure uh, along, along your string. So yeah, this is the standard buckling modeling here, and this is our advanced uh, buckling modeling there. Um, a case study now using that buckling severity index. So it was a, a failure post analysis on a liner uh, for an, an inch liner uh, uh, back end field. Uh, so here you see the description of a, a compression string, and you see that we can um, determine accurately the position, the modeling of a sleeve, the connection, the packer. So again, the idea is to do a good job at calculating these contact points and also the bending, the bending stress. So we look at that and we were um, able to explain a failure of that uh, liner because they uh, push hard on that liner to get to bottom. And we saw that they reach that high level of buckling severity index here. Again, of course, yes, you have to exceed the helical buckling limit. You have, let's say, no choice. But you, if you exceed that level, you need to have an index that monitor that to see if it's safe or not safe. So on that case, uh, they reach uh, 80 kilopound of compression, and they had a failure. So this is how we use that buckling severity index. Again, is to is to monitor the severity of buckling in these um, unconventional wells. This is the same case study. Uh, so it's interesting to see that if I go back there, so this is uh, this is the vertical section here. This is the curve here, and this is the lateral section. So we have seen that here and you see that on the right side, you have some helical buckling, right? So the pipe is helically buckled, but you can see that the bending stress is low. You see some colors, blue, green, meaning that the bending stress is low. On the contrary, if you start entering the curve, you see some red color, meaning that the bending stress is higher here. So there is a kind of um, contradiction, right? So we exceed the helical buckling limit here, but we are safe. And here we don't exceed the standard helical buckling, but this is the most dangerous situation there. This is that curve with strong dog leg that generates that lockup situation or failure. So again, this is why the monitoring of bending stress is more important than the shape taken by the pipe, because again, here, helical buckling, but it's perfectly fine. Another case where we look at uh, the difference along the curve, if we use different BHAs with different bends, uh, we are able to quantify uh, of course, uh, the contact forces, uh, the bending stress. 
And of course, the, the message here was uh, we have a tendency in that industry uh, to put a strong band uh, in our steerable main motor to be sure that we can uh, build. Uh, but the downside of that is that we're going to create a strong uh, slide rotate pattern, some strong localized dog leg, meaning that you will have contact forces, high bending stress. Uh, again, you see here uh, quickly the difference between drilling a well with a 1.5 uh, band and the 2.2 here, uh, the stress on your system will be very different because the tortuosity generated will be different. A and we can see the difference here in terms of contact forces, friction, uh, bending stress, and also getting your weight to the bit, right? When you slack some weight from the surface, uh, you have a hard time transferring that to the bit because of these tortuosity generated and that is well captured by, by the, the talk and drag software here. Uh, yes, you have, um, if you increase, the message was to say that if you increase uh, your bend angle, uh, you will increase uh, your buckling severity index. So for drilling, it's okay maybe, but when you have to run your casing string to TD, you will see some, some difficulties uh, running that casing. You will have maybe to rotate that casing. Again, uh, of course, uh, many reasons uh, to drill some uh, smooth wellbore compared to uh, tortuous wellbore. We have, uh, yeah, casing flotation. Uh, we can handle uh, the casing uh, flotation uh, in that uh, talk and drag and, and buckling model. Uh, so see uh, the difference in terms of bending. So this is a, a casing that we fill with mud up to that point, and then we float the casing there to reduce the friction. Uh, but look at look at the difference in terms of course tension compression, but also in terms of bending. Here, that uh, zone in red represents the bending stress on that casing compared to the blue one. Uh, again, uh, looking at the bending stress is key. I remember that uh, remind you that the limit for uh, fatigue is about 18 uh, ksi. Here we exceed that limit, so yeah, it's not very safe uh, for the uh, mechanical integrity of uh, your casing. Another example: so if you don't have any flotation here, so this is the same example. You have more buckling, higher contact forces. Uh, yeah, all that. Uh, all that example. Another case study uh, recently done uh, for offshore, uh, where you have uh, some buckling in the vertical section. So we could we could look at many aspects where we have to push the casing of a drill string, or uh, when we have to set the packer. The post buckling is key at looking at things in a more accurate way uh, to be sure that we, we, we are safe. Um, here it's another example of uh, all of a gauge effect or if you have a washout. Uh, here we are along the lateral section. Uh, you see some all of a gauge or washout and, and we see the effect of uh, the weight on bit. So we increase the weight on bit uh, from uh, 20 kilopound to uh, 40 kilopound, and you start to see the pipe taking a uh, sinusoidal and then helical shape. Um, yeah, we, we can we can be very accurate now in terms of modeling uh, as soon as we add uh, good data, uh, good quality data uh, in in the in the software. Another example with a rigid centralizer. A study done recently by my colleagues. So here we wanted to look, or the operator wanted to look at the effect of the centralizer size, the effect on the buckling, uh, going from a 24 inch rigid centralizer to 28 inch rigid centralizer, uh, because we wanted to select the right uh, size for that centralizer. And we are looking at the bending stress we are looking uh, at the, ben, um, uh, the contact point. So again, that post buckling has many applications in our industry, as you, as you can see. Now, as I said at the beginning, uh, there are uh, new technology on the market. Uh, so 
and we need to account for that in our software. So uh, we recently developed um, the actual oscillation tool, uh, the agitators, the fact that we shake uh, the drill string along the well bore. So you, you, you create uh, oscillation there with a given magnitude, with a different frequency. And the idea of that tool is to reduce the friction. But now what we want to do, of course, is to try to quantify the reduction of friction and also potentially uh, better position uh, that tool along uh, the drill string, potentially uh, select one or two agitators. I know that uh, some applications, they run two agitators along the string. But again, at the beginning, uh, for any model, you want to be sure that you have the right equipment downhole to better predict the friction. Uh, and also, may, yeah, we want to, to better uh, transfer the, the weight uh, to the bit. So we have developed that in our software. So we are able now to enter the position of the agitator, uh, the magnitude of the force, the frequency, again, to do a better job at uh, torque and drag uh, modeling. We have also the same for the oscillator at your face. Uh, you know that uh, in order to overcome uh, friction uh, in sliding mode, uh, what we do, uh, we hook the pipe uh, to the left, to the right. So we apply a number of wraps to the left and to the right. Uh, we also apply some RPM. And the question here is how many wraps do we want to apply? when and also what should be the RPM to apply that. So we have now the tool uh, to better predict the transfer of that surface oscillation uh, along the well bore. And we can even uh, combine the two. So you can have the oscillator uh, at the surface, you can have an agitator downhole, and you have that torsional motion you have that actual motion. So you can see that, yeah, there are some uh, modeling to do uh, to better quantify, again, the friction along the well bore. So this is the, the, the first uh, situation where we don't have any overlap of the two waves, one coming from the surface, one coming from down hole. But there are some situations where you have overlap. Uh, the, the wave coming from the surface uh, is overlapping the one coming from down hole. So we have we have uh, made some simulation, again, to provide a tool for the industry to better quantify the reduction of friction and also to optimize the parameters at your face and down hole to be sure that we can drill safely these wells and also that we can apply the right amount of weight on the bit uh, to achieve a good rate of uh, penetration. So this is a this is a, an example uh, where we have that uh, uh, wraps coming from the surface, and we have that uh, agitator here that checking the, the string. Uh, and yes, and we need to calculate all these uh, contact forces uh, to predict to better predict the hook load and, and torque. Uh, so this is an example of uh, torque and drag modeling. So we are at 16,000 feet, uh, we slide drilling, we have some oscillator at your face, so we apply five wraps to the left, five wraps to the uh, right. We have a 50 RPM, at the same time we have agitator down hole, and you can see so on that graph, so we have, um, we have um, an output to quantify the actual friction reduction, and at the end of the day, the efficiency of this tool. So what we see, we see the actual friction reduction as a function of depth. So when the reduction is 100%, it means that, yes, we are doing a good job at removing that actual friction. And you can see that here in that zone, we don't shake at all that drill string. Uh, so we have a sliding motion and then we start to feel the influence of the agitator around that zone. So this is the influence zone of the agitator, the influence zone of that oscillator. And of course, we would like to shake all the drill string from surface to the bit. Uh, and that depends always as uh, uh, depends on the friction coefficient. 
because depending on the friction factor, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5, uh, you don't set your parameters the same way. Uh, you need to put more wraps at your face to overcome uh, more friction. But again, uh, just uh, the evolution of torque and drag and buckling uh, model where you can see that we can take into account now uh, many parameters. So it starts to be very complex uh, now. The next one, next job. So we have um, a model, uh, the effect of uh, fluid effect. Uh, if you have, if you change your flow rate, uh, you will see that you have a different hook load. Uh, it has also a consequence on the weight on bit, on the zeroing of the weight on bit. Uh, so yes, I, I, I'm not going to show you some results because it's a publication uh, soon in one month, and it will be presented that uh, in Norway in uh, Stavanger uh, with my uh, my colleague. So yeah, this is uh, maybe uh, not sure what time is it. Yeah, it's a uh, more than one hour. Um, yeah, I'm finished. And uh, yeah, if you have any question, uh, feel free to ask. Well, excellent presentation, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I, I didn't have enough ink in my pen to be able to take all the notes that I need to. But luckily, this is recorded. I can go back and, and watch this uh, several times over. All right. Um, so, guys, if y'all have some questions, go ahead and start putting them into the comment section now. Um, I think we've got I've got 17 of them loaded up right now. We're going to go back through and start kind of like running through these through some of these. Um, but also, you know, feel free to if you want, want to be able to say something uh, nice uh, for Stefan taking the time to be able to do this with us. All right, uh, Brian, it's going to uh, start it off for us. Most of the dog leg is obtained at the beginning of the stand for both RSS and steerable motor. Does the sinusoid predictor take this into consideration, uh, the slash or of a V? Yeah, so uh, again, at the beginning, I did explain how we can reconstruct the trajectory depending on the BHA. So for RSS, so what we will need is the activation of the RSS, uh, a percentage from zero to 100%, and of course the tool phase orientation. For the steerable motor, we need the same. We need the sliding sheet. And what we'll do uh, for the drilling, will reproduce that tortuosity every foot or so. So we'll see that effect at the beginning of the stand uh, where we have a high dog leg. Uh, so absolutely, we'll, we'll be able to quantify that um, Yeah, as soon as we have, again, uh, the data, the good data needed uh, to do a good uh, good modeling. All right, I'm going to keep throwing these out there as they come along. Great presentation, Dr. Manon. And then outstanding, thank you. So kudos to you, sir. All right, um, <clears throat> this one ended up getting answered in the comment section, but I kept it anyways just because this is actually something I can answer. Uh, so normally you're going to see your MWD inclination somewhere between on most probe-based MWD systems, 50 to 60 feet back. back. Um, but that is it dependent upon the BHA that you're running. If you've got rotary steerable, uh, plus it's driven by a motor, is the MWD above or below the motor? Uh, are you running RSS? And then as somebody also mentioned in the comment section, is there a near bit inclination, right? So um, standard mud motor, MWD, you know, US land kind of thing, um, 50 to 60 feet back. Look, I answered a question, yay. I feel good about myself there. All right, uh, the next one. Uh, Galim, uh, when I run the simulation for vertical well using stiff string, the model magnitude result is lower than actual event increased tortuosity. Any advice? Yeah, so I think at the time the industry had a tendency to neglect the measurement of the inclination in the vertical section because we say, yeah, it's about zero, one, two, three, we don't care. And the spacing was greater than the spacing we have. So first, in some wells, we have a bad knowledge of a vertical section first. And also, I didn't talk about that, but so once you have these, let's say what I call the open hole surveys, 
so you have a cased hole that will put in it, uh, depending on centralizer. So we have the possibility to reconstruct the cased hole trajectory, meaning that the dog legs inside will be a little bit different. So it depends on the centralizer placement. Um, yeah, so this is my advice. Try to know better that vertical section that we supposed to be almost vertical, but it's not. Uh, so even a small dog leg of, let's say, one, two degree uh, can generate high side forces. And it's an accumulation of forces and uh, along the drill string. So at the end, uh, it adapts and it, uh, it, yeah, it's a few kiloton. All right. Uh... More people saying thank you, uh, Jeremy. This is very informative. Enjoyed. Um, uh, Luther says excellent presentation. And this one I looked up. This is from uh, Rolando Suarez. Says great uh, presentation, Stefan. Thank you. All right, let's jump back over to our questions. Uh, Colleen, thank you for yours. Um, Angus, I think one of your coworkers there says it may sound counterintuitive that soft string overestimates the friction but that is because it underestimates the contact forces, observes the hook load, for example, and blames the friction. Yeah, so yeah, my, my colleague, uh, Angus Jemison, uh, right uh, to the next door. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so it's only if you consider some continuous survey. So if you process continuous survey or high density survey, every foot or so, you put that in a soft string, you will overestimate the friction because again, the, 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 the soft string will have a tendency to, to have all these dog legs every foot or so and will generate um, side force, additional side force due to that, you know, that equation that I did show you. So this is, yeah, this is the only case where you have an overestimation of, of friction if you use continuous survey in soft string uh, calculation. All right. Uh, and Angus, thank you for watching. It means a lot to me. Uh, question, soft string versus stiff string. With all stiff string model positive points and all negative points on soft model, why soft string is presented in drilling industry? What, it, what is its special application with all inaccuracies compared to stiff one? Where do we use it? Yeah, yeah. Probably many reasons. Uh, so first, the industry is very conservative. Uh, first, two, uh, soft string is uh, maybe cheaper than stiff, I would say. And also, um, you know, people have been using soft string for years and years and years. It works fine. They tweak the friction factor. And sometimes they have a bad surprise. Yeah, it doesn't work for that well. Yes, because probably you, you uh, neglected something. So again, uh, and also at the time, maybe the competition time, uh, but it's not the case anymore. Uh, stiff string are very fast now. It was not the case 20, 30 years ago. Uh, it's, yeah, so it's fast. It's getting more popular. Uh, people are much more used to that. Um, yeah, I think this is yeah the reason. And again, uh, there is that copy-paste uh, behavior. Uh, it works well here. Uh, I don't need some, you know, stiff string engine to, to run that. Um, but again, uh, the lateral section is, is uh, increasing. Uh, you have uh, buckling and, and see the, the tools that we need to add in the system to remove friction, right? Uh, so these tools are expensive. So yeah, if we can have a better prediction, uh, I think it's always good, um, yeah less costly than a, a failure or something happening on the well. All right. Uh, this one's from Mitch, who is presenting in two weeks. Yeah, February 14th. So he's spending Valentine's Day with me. Oh. Uh, one of the big unknowns that is required for stiff string model accuracy is the well path that is solved with continuous surveys. Another big one is the actual size and shape of the hole. If the hole is enlarged due to whirl or instability, just something to keep in mind. Not a question, but I thought it was a great point to be able to bring up. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, sometimes we had some uh, caliper uh, to better measure the hole size, but it's rare to run a caliper, so we don't have that. 
All right, we are getting tons of questions coming in there, uh, coming in faster than we're answering. All right, uh, then we've got Luis Gonzalez uh, and Luis's boss from, I don't know if it's his boss, maybe he's called his coworker, is presenting next week, Neil Armstrong. He'll be talking about applications. So there we go. Stiff, uh, he says stiff string models have some limitations as it is very difficult to know the true size and shape of the wellbore. Kind of goes back to the previous questions. I yeah. do washouts and due to wellbore stability. Therefore, contact points with the drill string um, and therefore in context, then is then is challenging to get accurate results if the wellbore size and clearance are assumed from the beginning. So two yeah, different people, that. two different yeah. comments, very similar to each other. Yeah, no, I, I think the industry has... Uh... A better knowledge now of a uh, well bore because of continuous survey or the fact that we can reconstruct the surveys with a model now the next one will be the the size of a borehole we we could right we could run a caliper but it's uh, extra time and cost so we we don't do that we have a few ideas on how to do that especially with a um, uh, slide rotate we know that uh, with a bend angle uh, of two degree with a double rotation, you have a tendency to have a, a higher hole size. So we we have a few ideas, but yeah, it's it's the limitation today uh, about that knowledge of uh, all size. Yeah, agree. Um, so not quite specific to the torque and drag questions here, but you know, operationally, how often are companies running continuous inclination and azimuth while drilling? Not enough, maybe. Well, uh, you know, maybe somebody can tag Ken Miller in this because I know the guys over at Erdos probably would love to be able to hear this. Because so I could say this at least: there are multiple third-party OEM uh, MWD directional drilling modules out there on the market that have this capability within them, and it's not. I mean, depending on the MWD service company, may not be an additional cost. It's just something that's there in the system. So uh, if we don't have the information while drilling, we cannot model correctly until post calculations are performed. And then no, so, so what, what we do, so what we do, so I didn't talk about the fact that we can run that talk and drag and booking model in real time. Uh, when I say real time is every survey. So what we do every survey, so we gather the standard survey, we update the broomstick plot, and also we can uh, reproduce the local dog leg, the tortuosity I did show you, in real time, meaning every stand or so. So I think we can have, in real time, a good knowledge of the shape of a trajectory if we have the right data at the right time using MTSML, EDR data, BHA, sliding sheet, it, it, it's done, it's done. It's just the, the willingness to do it, uh, but that can be done in, in real time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Florian, I, I think he might've been mentioning to somebody else, but we'll still throw it up here. If your weight on pit is limited by buckling, you can check with conservative assumption on over gauge. Usually the model will tell you that you can safely put more weight on bit than classic uh, Pasley, Dawson, sinusoidal and helical would allow. Yeah, Flo Florian is my uh, colleague. Uh, so uh, hello, Florian. He's in Austria. So you're checking in on him. Obviously, he's not doing work. He's just sitting here watching you. Uh, <laughs> John Dewar, uh, it would be good to hear from Stefan some comments on the benefits of open source models versus the benefits of open source data for testing pro proprietary models. No, yeah, I, I think uh, yeah that uh, initiative coming uh, from uh, Paul Pastusek and, and and the committee. So I think it's good uh, for the academic world uh, to compare your work to someone else. Um, as you know, uh, the industry is very competitive, uh, and we have some proprietary models. Uh, we can share some part of it, but of course not everything. Uh, but at least it's a good initiative uh, for the for education purposes, for research purposes, to share all what we have uh, in the industry. But there will be always, you know, uh, limitation in that. But it's it's good. I like I like that. All right. Uh, next question is from Rawad. He's actually got two, so we'll get both of them right in a row. 
do those models take into account pipe twist and how it affects buckling? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I didn't cover that, but we calculate the stretch and also we calculate the twist uh, of, a, of a system um, due to buckling or due to rotation. Uh, yeah, we do that. Excellent. All right. Next question from what? Question two, can the stiff string model and accounting for pipe roll help model stick slip generated from the pipe contact? And is there a way to apply the stick slip to apply the stick slip coming from the bit? Yeah, so it's it, it's a it's a good point because uh, so we have the surface oscillation in the torque and drag buckling model, but we can also uh, solve that with a stick slip model. So it's it's different. Uh, it's a different type of modeling. It's a time domain modeling, so we are not static anymore or steady state. We go to the time domain vibration type of modeling. Uh, but uh, yes, we can do that. So it's our time domain module that we have for whirling, stick slip, uh, HFTO. Uh, it's, uh, it's available. It's a longer competition time, of course. It's not a matter of second, uh, but it's, it's, it's doable to do that um now in the industry again i think we have made many progress in the industry generally speaking uh, thanks to better data sensor down hole uh, the computer power is uh, is is better uh, we have been doing that research for 20 30 years now so many are doing that research also so good progress on, on that part to have a better understanding of all these torque drag buckling vibration all that stuff HFTO is a kind of new, uh, but we, I have seen already some studies uh, on that uh, about you know the resonance of that BHA. Um, yeah. All right, next one's here from Mitch, who's gonna be with us on February 14th, so don't forget that. Question, to calculate the additional bending stress and normal force due to the pipe bending, is, is the OD of the pipe body or the tool joint used? Both, we, we use both. So we have, so in fact, we, we discretize the pipe as the tool joint, the body, tool joint, body, et cetera. So we, we can, we can uh, um, take into account both. We look at the bending stress all along the pipe in the tool joint section, body section, everywhere. What would you do in the case of a flex joint then? Because it's got abnormal, yeah. like, you know. Uh, yeah, we, we had some uh, BHA with um, a flex drill collar, so we just need uh, the mass uh, stiffness of that tubular, all the sizes, the right dimension, and we'll put that in the, in, in the software. So we have a discretization, a meshing, and if you need to be very accurate, we can. Uh, there is almost no limitation uh, in what we can do. Uh, in terms of uh, modeling discretization. Okay, excellent. Mitch, thank you for your question and thank you for coming on to be a presenter in two weeks. All right, uh, all right. Uh, is stiff string model, uh, is stiff string model, is there a rule slash guide on how many nodes or segments per feet <laughs> or per meter for FEA during uh, torque and drag computation? The, there should be an optimum point between accuracy and computation time, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, there is a compromise to reach. So uh, you don't want to mesh every millimeter. Does it make sense, right? Uh, so I would say that it depends on the expected final deflection that we, you will get. Uh, but typically, uh, I don't know, half a meter is sufficient most of the time. All right, pull that one off. There we go. Uh, Bezat, uh, do soft string model outputs in this presentation have the additional force due to buckling applied to them? No, I have to be honest, I didn't apply. So I know that some soft string model, what they do, so there are some literature equation. They say, okay, if there is helical buckling, you need to apply that formula. Uh, to account for the additional force, but I didn't apply these in my in my presentation, of course, to give uh, more benefit to the stiff string engine. 
<laughs> All right. Oh, that's the same one. I clicked the wrong button. There we go. Uh, what's the difference of the BSI and comparing von Mises stress of the pipe to its ultimate stress? Hmm. Uh, not sure to understand that one. Uh, but again, I definitely don't understand it. Yeah. So <laughs> again, the coupling severity index. So we calculate the contact force, the bending stress, and the formula stress. The bending stress, we are going to link that to the fatigue, because if you have a bending and you rotate, you will have some fatigue. So we are looking at the number of cycles before uh, failure. Uh, and of course, the formula stress is the ultimate stress, I mean, ultimate, uh, the stress we don't want to exceed. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm sure if I answer the question, but this is my, my answer. Uh, just to go back here, so Rawad asked, uh, to, to the two questions he asked, he says, thanks. Um, and then also Ari says, uh, thanks for the answer. Very insightful content, Dr. Stefan. Uh, modeling animations are too cool. Um, and then uh, Dallas says, thank you, Stefan and David. Great show. Have to go. All right. Some of us do have to work today. So just want to get a couple of those in there. All right. Uh, Daryl Chicken, great presentation. Have you run downhole sensors to verify the modeling of running both surf surface oscillations and downhole friction reduction tools as to the distance each one is having an effect? I have. Yeah. Yeah. We had a uh, few cases, uh, you know, in the modeling world, we are very demanding with regards to data that we need to validate what we have. But we have a few cases where we were able to to validate uh, that. Uh, yes. Daryl, thank you for your question, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, Bezad, uh, ask another one. It would be great if in this series we can, com can have comparison between soft string and stiff string models by comparing the results to actual field values. Yeah. Any thoughts? No, I, yeah, I agree. Maybe the next uh, presentation we show. Maybe possibly, there we go. Uh, Eric asks, uh, where would you recommend a centralizer placement relative to a casing connection to minimize casing wear? Hmm. I need to process that one a little bit more. <laughs> um, Feel free. I mean, we, we did do um, a lot of wear stuff in the second episode with um, Trules from Oleosoft. So um, maybe a mix of the two there. And and this yeah. is something that, you know, maybe we could just tell Brandon that he needs to work on it so that yeah, he can I, answer I, in the wrap-up show. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I didn't discuss about casing wear, but uh, as you can imagine, if we have a better estimation of a contact force, contact point, we have a better estimation of the wear. So we use the same engine for the casing wear modeling as well, using the stiff string, using uh, also the potential buckling to better predict the casing wear. Uh, because again, contact point is just key in uh, casing wear modeling. So if you underestimate the contact force, you will underestimate the casing wear. Right. Uh, next one here is from Jonathan. If FEA is not used in the stiff string model, how are the contact points calculated? Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a good point because I, I forgot, uh, I will share the, the list of our uh, publication. So, uh, 50, 60 publication, and uh, there are a few publication with more details about the algorithm, uh, not in all details uh, secret, but uh, there are more, um, more details uh, for the contact point calculation. So I will share that in the, in the presentation. Uh, is that just as a co comment here? Stiff string models need more accurate data for boundary conditions of FEA. And that can be very costly. So I know that uh, most talk and drag user, they neglect the BHA. They just put a bit drill color and that's it. 
but we had some situations where the BHA was stiff. Uh, so we need to model accurately to put the drill collar, the stabilizer in tight hole condition because they generate high contact forces. And at the end, it adds up in the in the torque and drag buckling. So um, otherwise, we don't need more data uh, for stiff string engine. They are using the same data as soft string. You know, the BHA report is sufficient uh, for us uh, to do any 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 mod any modeling. All right. Um, next one here is from uh, Cadell says, as always, amazing pre presentation, Dr. Stefan. So quick question, which configuration is preferred? The overlapping between the rotation effects from the surface and the downhole agitator or not having overlapping at all? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a tough one. Nobody's I asking easy questions today. Yeah, no, it's... Um... And, and also uh, for that, it's uh, uh, it's very complex to know exactly that propagation of a wave coming from the surface and the one down hole. To be honest, except if we put you know sensor everywhere, uh, it's always some discrete measurement. Um, maybe I would say we should try, right? <laughs> we should try. Hey, I, I'm all for putting all kinds of sensors down hole. Um, this is LinkedIn user says, great presentation, Dr. Manal, um, and quite uh, instructive. If my twist off with BHA with agitator at crossover with drill collar to heavyweight drill pipe while drilling surface hole, what is likely the cause of the twist off? Is the failure due to string vibration or crossover material failure this one was kind of answered in the comment section but i want to like give you a chance to yeah um I, uh, maybe we we could uh, we could have uh, data uh, again uh, always difficult to uh, explain a failure uh, like that but if we look uh, again our way of working is to collect data as some context and process do some modeling and then give the best answer that we can um yeah i think that one uh came from kennedy uh so kennedy if you can share your data yeah. maybe we could we could do absolutely a, a, uh you know hand over the data and then do a post failure data analysis show because i would absolutely love that i think you know anybody that's willing to share if anybody is still watching this if you're willing to share data um with any of the experts that i've lined up um and and we can do a post failure analysis or something to be able to educate everybody, you know, I, I know I'm on the SB paper selection committee, but you know, screw it. Let's do it here live. You know, I, I am the selection committee when it comes to that. So, um, that'd be a lot of fun. So we get tons of people, uh, SOTs, uh, are only used while drilling in slide mode. Question mark. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, we want to overcome the, the friction in the sliding mode to better transfer the weight to the bit. Yes, so it's correct. Okay, there we go. Easy one. All right. Uh, hi, Stefan. Thanks for the outstanding presentation. It was shown that stiff model is much more accurate than the soft one. However, since the DSC software still provides access to the soft model, for what purposes you recommend to choose it the soft yeah it's a, it, it's a good point so we decided to uh, also have uh, the two uh, because I, I i think that first user they like to compare they can compare themselves the difference between the soft and the stiff so in our drill scan software we have both soft and stiff and people can compare uh, and soft is always quicker uh, than the stiff uh, it's some extra second for the stiff, uh, but the soft is quicker. So it's a way to, to compare. Uh, and um, yeah, that's it. Um, just, just to throw this out there, we got another person in the comment section helping out. And this is why we do this live. This is why we, we provide this platform for everybody. The twist off over there on the crossover between the drill call and heavyweight drill pipe usually happens due to fatigue and cyclical stress. And finally, material failure. So 
just everybody throwing out, you know, possible answers. This is, this is great. The community is coming together here, right? So uh, Brian's got the next one. If the stiff model predicted downhole weight on bit good enough to not use downhole weight on bit LWD measurements? If we do some good calibration on a given pad uh, from well to well, why not? Why not? Uh, but uh, realistically, we know that uh, uh, all wells are different. Uh, we'll do a better job for sure, uh, but it requires some kind of calibration from well to well uh, to fully trust any model, by the way. Uh, we can talk about talk and drag and buckling and stick slip and whirling, all that stuff. Uh, to fully trust a given model, you need to have a, uh, a good calibration of this model. Um, yeah. But of course, uh, I have to recognize that the sensor is just for the truth, right? Uh, down hole, if you don't have any bias, offset, all that stuff, of course, for this sensor, uh, because sometimes they, they give some you know wrong um, data, but um, yeah, again, uh, modeling plus calibration, we can do a better job. All right. Uh, so the, the next question, um, um, I don't know, this one's a little bit different. It's kind of off. Uh, also, which bit is best for directional well drilling, bit with long gauge or bit short gauge, and why? Um, yeah, it depends on the system you use BHA, the push, the point, the steerable and motor. So it's not uh, an easy answer. Uh, but again, you need to look at your application, look at the bill rate, uh, ask, and try to find the best system for your application, uh, BHA plus bit. So yeah, difficult um, question here. Yeah, I was trying to find uh, there's I mean, that's probably a question for, you know, maybe Paul Pestusik uh, or uh, uh, I think it's Daniel Dishnell that's over at uh, Shell. I'm trying to see if I can find him to tag him in uh, the comment section. All right, on to the next one. Uh, great presentation, Dr. Manon, and quite instructive. Oh, wait, we already did that one. That one kind of got back in there. Uh, there we go. That was actually a question to somebody else in there. There we go. Great presentation. Dr. Manon, did you have a different result using with or without stabilizer on a horizontal well? How is the software differentiate the different bend setting while drilling longer horizontal wells? Thank you. That's from Andy. Yeah, not sure to, to understand that uh, the, the sense of that. Uh question but uh, again in our talk and drag and bubbling software we uh, describe the bha in details with a stabilizer a band all that and again in some situations depending on the local dog leg you have it it uh, it, it uh, creates some high contact forces and as a consequence higher talk and drag so yeah, this is the, the main difference with other software where we can model accurately all these BHA components and have a better estimation of the loads. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, get that one. Now we're here one. Uh, what simple explanation can you give when only one or two drill pipe joints are bent and the rest of the drill string is okay. Can you give reasons for such situations? Very interesting question. Yeah. But again, with a, you know, high density survey or continuous survey, we, we see things, right? We see things that we don't see with a standard survey. And, and sometimes we are just surprised by a localized dog leg somewhere for any reason. And the, the, the drill string has to go through that and uh, generating some, you know, loads, all that. All righty. Uh, not directly related to running torque and but what is a good critical speed software that can be used for BHA analysis? Easy one. Ours. We have, uh, we have that. <laughs> we have a critical speed 
calculation. Yeah, we, we have uh, the full drilling mechanics suite with vibration, talk and drag, you know, so we do that as well. And in real time, too. I did give you the chance to make a plug there. Uh, which one is more accurate, soft string with BSMF or stiff string for horizontal wells based on experience? What will be the effect of hole size? Yeah, the, the, the bending stress magnification factor was done for uh, fatigue. Uh, the fact that you have a pipe with two joint and the body. So some offers came up with some, um, some formula uh, to have a, a better estimation of the bending along the pipe, two joint and body. Uh, again, now with uh, numerical methods, you, you don't need the bending stress magnification factor because you can discretize uh, exactly the, the truth. Uh, so again, all this formula from the past, I would say, was because we had some limitation on the computer power at that time, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And, and uh, we needed to come up, to come up with some uh, estimation using some, some formula. So, um, so now it's, it's replaced by all these numerical engines that can do a better job. Um, all right, just giving some love to our uh, sponsor for today, which is, by the way, DTEC, thank you guys so much for sponsoring us today. Be sure to give them some love, guys. Uh, so I am going to ask one thing for you guys. Uh, just type it into the comment section. Just do the little, like, tag DTEC into the comments for anybody that's still watching. I'd just love to be able to give them a, a little extra boost there with their social media. Uh, what, is the perf what is the method for effective weight on bit estimation to any trajectory of the wells by using your simulation? <laughs> Calibration of the torque and drag software, so calibration of the hook load. Uh, what is, I mean, calibration of the friction factor of the hook load, and what is the weight on bit to fit that hook load at your face? Uh, again, um, that estimation requires some calibration on a regular basis. And you all know that the friction factor on the well is not a constant throughout the well. So it's a kind of log of friction factor going from 0 to 2, 0 to 5, 0 to 3, 0 to 4, depending. So it's not a constant. So it's not if it's not a constant, your torque and drag model needs to be updated on a regular basis. So this is why we use torque and drag in real time to have a better knowledge, because friction factor, again, it's not a constant and will never be a constant. Maybe in the cased hole section, much more stable friction factor, but in the open hole section, no way because you have cuttings, you have, yeah, many things are happening there. Uh, we know that it's between 0 to 0 4, but between the two, you have a big difference. So you will have a, a wrong estimation of the weight on it. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a difficult exercise. Uh, All right, so just to be able to throw it out there, Brian says, Dr. Manal, excellent presentation, very practical. Uh, Andy says, thanks, Dr. Manal, uh, great answer. Uh, and then we have our final question of the day. Does the model simulate the effect of downhole axial oscillations on stick slip? That's not that hard. one, not that one, but uh, we have a stick slip engine uh, time domain modeling where we can uh, quantify the potential effect of agitator on stick slip. Yes. There we go. And that's the last question of the day. Let's wrap this thing up. Uh, Stefan, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for coming on here and being able to uh, present. Uh, thank you so much to DTEC for being an amazing sponsor. Um, do me a favor you guys uh go like share subscribe do all the social media things for all the people involved myself if you want to get notifications when we go live for this show uh for the uh, the torque and drag series and or any of the other 
um, silly content that I'm putting out there on LinkedIn. Um, uh, go follow h and um, Go follow uh, Stefan. Um, follow the guys over at DTEC. Uh, and stay tuned for this. So here we go. Next week, we've got uh, Neil Armstrong with Merlin. He's going to be coming on. Uh, talking about uh, applications of so modeling best practices, reporting best practices, and a polling quiz. Not really sure how we're going to do that one, but we'll get it done. After that is Mitch with KM. He's coming on casing flotation, torque and drag reduction tools, casing liner drill pipe swivels, and casing and liner cementing load. Right? Lots of stuff there. Uh, the week after that, uh, Debbie's coming on and she's going to be talking about drilling and survey practices, high angle hole cleaning, well bore stability, lost circulation, tripping practices, real time monitoring considerations. She has got tons and tons and tons of real world rig application with all of this stuff. Lots of great stuff there. And then finally, on February 28th, once again, Brandon Foster is coming back on. All right. Uh, this week for the Vidor Locksmiths, we got Ahmad Amer from New Park. This is this Friday, and we're talking about uh, drilling fluid myths. So be sure to tune, tune in on that one. And then next Friday, on my birthday, Kenny Baker and Mike Holcomb to be talking about the new generation of floor hands. And we'll be live streaming directly from the Patterson Rig Up Yard. Oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> what are these? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's a chocolate <laughs> and it's special cameo appearances from angus Jamison and todd benson uh you guys feel free to come back on screen there both of those guys are vidor locksmith alumni uh very happy to have both of them uh jump in there that's great to see them both uh i know both those guys got a great sense of humor so uh once again uh Bazan says thanks dr Manal. uh thanks a lot david and dr stefan great show uh dtech great presentation barry lacoste says thanks uh stefan and david and actually dtech rotor available and miss rebus says thanks for the presentation thanks everybody for watching really do appreciate it like share subscribe tell your friends follow me on linkedin um special thanks to dtech really do appreciate those guys oh i need to take that one off um uh, oops keep hitting all the wrong buttons uh Stephon, thank you so much for taking all the time no, thank really, you my really pleasure really thank you david it. and thank um, you everyone yeah uh and tune in this friday and then we'll be back next tuesday as always uh guys know your industry